join me in welcoming Mevi and Elif. So we thought the best way to begin for those of you who haven't already read the book was for Elif to kick things off with a brief reading from it before we chat. So do you want to just tell us which part you're reading from, where it appears in either or? Um, I am reading from the very beginning, from page five. And the, you know, the only thing that you need to know is that she got back to school. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to start. So the, this is on, everyone can hear. Okay, cool. Um, Svetlana got to campus the day after me, though it felt like years. I had already slept the night in my new room, eaten breakfast and lunch in the cafeteria, and made numerous trips back and forth to the storage facility, having the same conversation over and over. How was your summer? How was your summer? How was Hungary? I was dissatisfied by the vagueness of my own answers. I still hadn't figured out the right angle. How was Hungary? Lakshmi asked at lunch with a conspiratorial sparkle. Did anything happen? Notwithstanding my strong feeling that a lot of things had happened, I answered the question truthfully in the sense that I knew Lakshmi intended it. Nothing had happened. Svetlana asked me the same question that evening when we met at her warehouse-like suite in New Quincy and sat on beanbag chairs under an Edward Hopper poster and talked about everything that had happened since the last time we had spoken, when I had been in a phone booth in the Hungarian village and Svetlana had been at her grandmother's house in Belgrade. I told her how I had finally called Ivan in Budapest, how he had showed up in a canoe and we had sat up all night at his parents' house. Did anything happen? <laughs> she asked in a lazier, more amused voice than Lakshmi's, but meaning the same thing. Well, like that one thing didn't happen, I said. Oh, Céline, Svetlana said. When Ivan first told me about the summer program in Hungary, he said I should take my time to think about it because he didn't want to force me into anything. Svetlana said that if I agreed to go, Ivan was going to try to have sex with me. This was a possibility I had never previously considered. I daydreamed about Ivan all the time, imagining different conversations we might have, how he might look at me, touch my hair, kiss me, but I never thought about having sex. What I knew about having sex did not correspond to anything I wanted or had felt. I had tried on multiple occasions to put in a tampon. Tampons were spoken of by older or more sophisticated girls as being somehow more liberated and feminist than maxi pads. <laughs> I just put one in and forget about it. <laughs> I felt troubled by the implication that a person was constantly thinking about their maxi pad. Nonetheless, every few months I would give tampons another shot. It was always the same. No matter what direction I pushed the applicator, however methodically I tried all the different angles, the result was a blinding electric pain. I read and reread the instructions. Clearly, I was doing something wrong. But what? It was worrisome, especially since I was pretty sure that a guy, that Ivan, would be bigger than a tampon. <laughs> but at that point, my brain stopped being able to entertain it. It became unthinkable. Svetlana said I had better think about it. You wouldn't want to end up in that situation and not have thought about it, she said, reasonably. And yet, it turned out there wasn't much to think about. It was immediately obvious that if Ivan tried to have sex with me, I would let him. Maybe he would be able to tell me what I had been doing wrong, and it wouldn't be as terrible as trying to put in a tampon. <laughs> Thank you. It just struck me as you were reading that, that it's 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 interesting that for a novel that has that features so many scenes of Selin reading other novels, and in fact I have stacked some of the novels that Selin reads over here. This is our either or syllabus, which you can all check out. Uh, it's interesting that the the first scene of reading is the reading of a tampon manual. Yeah, I was I was thinking about that. I mean, the, so the tampon scene was already there, um, and I added the the instructions because. 
like instruction manuals, it was something that I was thinking about a lot. I was thinking of either or as an instruction manual. At the end, she does the research for Let's Go, which is kind of an instruction manual. I was thinking a lot about the concept of advice and does advice work or do you have to make your own mistakes? Um, so that was something I had her engage with. Yeah, I, I actually don't think the LRB had a copy of Let's Go, but if anyone yeah. has a tampon <laughs> manual that they want to put on the top of this stack, I invite you to come up here and do that. Um, you know, it's treat to talk to an Oxford professor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the syllabus all. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I mean, instruction is interesting because one of the things that throughout either or, and I think throughout The Idiot too, that Céline is looking to literature for mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, our instructions on how to lead either an aesthetic or an ethical life. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, the kind of freedom that living either an aesthetic or ethical life requires would never would never be found by doing something like following the directions mm -hmm. in a novel. So how do you think about the way that Céline reads and what she takes from literature and maybe more broadly how it is that we do relate literature to our aesthetic or ethical lives? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question because I didn't really think about it this way until just now, but you're right. What she's looking for are instructions on how to live a free life. She's looking for instructions for how to be, how to become an autonomous person, which is not necessarily a thing that you can find instructions for. Um, although I, I, I do think you can. So I, I no longer think that, you know, she, Selin gets very fixated on the idea of an aesthetical, an aesthetic versus an ethical life, which is something that Svetlana mentions to her. And it's like the first time that she's heard any kind of like acknowledgement that there are different ways to live a life and that you could learn one and you could study it and there's books about it. And in general, she's very attracted to philosophy classes and she periodically tries to take them and has various bad experiences, which are drawn quite, uh, literally from my own life. Um, I, I was just quite disappointed by, by the, the ability of, the, the answers that I was looking for in philosophy, I, I ended up finding more in literature classes. Um, I now think that the idea of living an aesthetic versus an ethical life is, um, it's a, it's a, foolish distinction that does not make sense to draw. Um, I think Céline could have read The Ethics of Ambiguity by Simone de Beauvoir, which really kind of gives you instructions for how to live mm -hmm. a free life, which is exactly how she puts it. And what she says is the way to live a free life Okay, you can't. It's not if you live a, if you live an aesthetic life, you're trying to to be free and have wonderful ad adventures. But you're constantly coming up. And she's talking about Nietzsche, basically. But you're constantly coming up against this problem, which is um, the unfreedom of others. So it's like if you're the only free person, it's like you have a snow day, but all your friends are at school. Do you have snow days in England or like? You, no, yeah. it doesn't. Well, oh, yeah, I mean, yes, yes. If like there's half an inch of snow on the ground, oh, everyone okay. freaks out and shuts okay. down the school. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if everyone else is in school, like you don't have, like you, you don't have a, a free day. So, so trying to be free is always about trying to free yourself and other people at the same time, and that's the way to live, and that's her. And but you have to, but you can't make up a single rule because she's also talking about Kant. She's talking to Nietzsche and Kant at the same time, and she's like, Kant, you can't make up just one rule and try to follow it all the time because, um, I, because it's crazy and um, and you need to evaluate just each situation on a case by case basis because sometimes you're freeing yourself is going to mean unfreeing others like you're, it's a constant negotiation and you're going to fail and that's part of it and knowing it is part of it well and this is the problem that she runs into when she reads the first book on our syllabus <laughs> Kierkegaard's either or right is she reads the seducer's diary mm -hmm. and she thinks what does it mean that living aesthetically requires ruining mm -hmm. other people right mm -hmm. kind of the same problem that she has when she reads when she reads Breton right yeah um, so so how does she how does she read either? I mean, is, is that with a, is she grappling with that stuff early on in the novel or does she only, is she seduced by the seducer's diary um, or is its limitation on the freedom of others uh, something that she, that she recognizes? It's interesting because she's like, like I was actually thinking about the idiot. Like I, I'm, I wish I was better at making up titles um, and not just using other people's titles. But if I if I did make up a title, I would have called it something like the literalist because I feel like she takes things extremely literally, like maybe to the extent that they're not meant to be taken. So the way that she reads it, it's it's interesting also because it was it was sort of an act of remembering because Céline is very close to my younger self, but it was also kind of imagining or inventing because I can't completely remember relating to the world in this way that now seems quite peculiar. Like mm -hmm. she's reading, there's like a lot of 
critical energy that she's bringing to things where she's like, okay, that guy just caused someone to like, that guy just is a murderer. This person's like a, you know, this person just sent someone to insane asylum. That's not cool. Is this okay? Like, but she's also reading it like, okay, what are the pointers for me? Like at no point is she like, oh, okay, I guess this is all garbage and I should just throw it out and not pay attention to it. She's like, mm -hmm. I need to read it again and find out what the, what, you know, what can I learn from it? What's the real message? And I, I guess I think of a lot of this book, I don't know. I've kind of been thinking, I mean, we were just talking about Adrian Rich, like I've been thinking about patriarchy <laughs> and I, I am in general having, um, I don't, I don't love the term patriarchy anymore just because it's gendered. I think what it, what I keep coming up against is this kind of hierarchy that puts, you know, and it does put men above women and, you know, the pure reason above feelings and the body. And, um, but it's also comes up in an empire, like at the end of the book with let's go, I think she's coming to terms with how, with the, um, imperial legacy of the novel, that there's this kind of like, there's the recognized and the rigorous and the universal and the known. And she can sense already that those, that there's some, you know, there's some malarkey going on in there. It's not like, it's, it's, it's not fair to women. It's there's, there's something crooked is going on there, mm -hmm. but she has it, but she's so afraid of the opposite of that, which is like to be in this like annihilating languageless space where you're being described and you're not describing kind of like, like what Simone de Beauvoir talks about in the second sex, but like even like kind of beyond gender, like the thing mm -hmm. she's like, she always wants to be the thing that Simone de Beauvoir points out correctly is associated with, with men and does not want to be the thing that's associated with women. And that means reading these particular books and understanding them and mm -hmm. having some kind of universal experience with them. No, I want to get back to something that you said about how crafting her was an act of both remembering, but mm -hmm. also feeling really estranged mm -hmm. from that scene of remembering, because I kept thinking as I was reading your novel about Bakhtin and about double voicing, mm -hmm. the sense that we are in Selin's head mm -hmm. and it is so kind of tightly controlled and the yeah. voice is so 1996 mm -hmm. and the cultural markers are also 1996. But at the same time, you have this amazing control of, of irony where we're getting 1996, but through a kind of 2022 sensibility. And I thought about this, especially in all the scenes of, you know, sexual assault mm -hmm. that are taking place in the novel, which Selin doesn't quite recognize them as such. She would never, call she it would that, never yeah. have called it that. So can you just talk a little bit about that distance between 1996 and 2022 and what you had to do to kind of bridge that, that, that chasm of, of consciousness? First of all, I'm really, really grateful to you for saying that because I think not everyone got that. And that I, I do think of that as the main kind of point of the book. Um, so I wrote this book when I was on tour with The Idiot. I was promoting The Idiot, which I wrote it's, I wrote it much closer to the time that it's about. Um, and it was, that was at the, um, at the end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017, which was this time when there was this, um, it was right, Me Too was about to start and the, there was already the, um, you know, like Trump had the pussy tape thing had happened and there was a lot of anger and a lot of, um, and it was a time when a lot of people were revisiting the nineties in general, especially, especially in the, in the, you know, realm of consent. And uh, there was, in, in the U.S., there was a lot of rethinking about Monica Lewinsky, the Clinton's relationship with Monica Lewinsky, and how, how we thought of that at the time, and, and how, you know, do we really think about that the same way now? Like, how do we think about a 24-year-old intern who's, like, having an affair with, like, the most powerful person? And, yeah. Well, feminists largely threw her under the bus, yeah, didn't they? I mean, that was what bus. was shocking yeah. about looking back at 1994, It was shocking. Right? It was truly yeah. shocking. Yeah. People printed what feminists had said, and it was like, I would have loved to get with that naughty president, or, like, finally someone's treating us like people. It was crazy. It was craziness. And, um, and then, and then me too, uh, then me too happened. And then there was the Kavanaugh hearing where Christine Blasey Ford gave this testimony and that brought up the specter of Anita Hill. And we were rethinking Anita Hill and how appallingly she had been treated by people, including Joe Biden, which is, you know, we'll just pass over that. But, um, and it was a time when a lot of people were revisiting a lot of women. We were retelling our early sexual histories, especially people who were who grew up in the '90s, but also people who were, you know, ten years younger and and older, and yeah. uh, you know, because yeah. it, it was yeah. a new thing. We were retelling our early sexual histories and using vocabulary that we did not have at the time, which is a crazy cognitive exercise to to use words like rape culture and even patriarchy, which it's not like they didn't exist then, but they weren't in the mainstream, and they're in the mainstream now. Um, so. I, you know, and, and I actually, I remember during the Kavanaugh hearing, I looked up my diary from 1991 because I wanted to see what I'd written about 
Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill and how I thought about it at the time. And it was very frustrating because, you know, that was the year that I, I gave Celia this experience that, that I had, which was my parents were in a custody dispute. Um, and that happened in 1991. So it was mostly about that. And then there's like one sentence where like, Clarence Thomas is a shithead or something. <laughs> that was like the <laughs> only mention of this. So I was like, great, thanks, thanks, old past me. Um, <laughs> so trying to remember, so I was re-describing certain incidents that happened in my life and realizing, oh, you know, I would call that rape and I, I would call that date rape. I, you know, here's how I would contextualize it. And I was trying to think like, how did I rationalize it to myself at the time? And how did I not feel that something terrible was happening to me? And how did I furthermore feel invested in the idea that, that I, I, you know, I'm not a victim, nothing terrible has happened to me. I don't have to be a feminist because the feminists already did it and it's over and I have my rights and I don't need to like keep harping on that and keep harping on being a woman. I can just go ahead and do the thing. Like what made me think that that was the best course for me, that that was the, how I was going to feel the most whole and, and I don't know, mm. competent. So, and I don't really remember. So it was a lot of like, I reread books that I had read then. I, I put together, it, you know, I, I, I remember particular conversations that I had, but it was a lot of kind of like restaging and reimagining. And that's like, you know, one question I got is like, why didn't you just write a memoir if it's so close to you? And that's why it's like, it's an imaginative mm, right. exercise to get right. in touch with your past self. It, well, ab yeah, absolutely. And I think any encounter with your past self filtered through the present is always going to involve yeah, some kind of yeah. fictionalization. You're projecting yeah, a voice exactly. that doesn't exist anymore, exactly. right? Exactly. Plus, like, originally this book was going to have um, an essay at the end, or it, it was going to be two halves, like Kierkegaard's either or, where the two halves contradict each mm -hmm. other. And the first half was going to be a novel set in the 90s. And the second half was going to be, like, an essay about how novels only led me into harm. And maybe we should, like, rethink how we feel about novels. <laughs> and it was going to be set in the present, and it was going to use all the vocabulary that we have now and um you and I have spoken about that before yeah. about how you feel like novels lead, led to your sort of depoliticization yeah, yeah, yeah. and they led you to a I don't know morally harmful place is that is that accurate morally or no harmful. or to harm would, to harm yeah they, they led me to make choices that restricted my own freedom let me put it and and and, and I would say restricted the freedom of others to a certain extent so we have a couple of the the books in the stack that, yes, that yes, are, yes. are are about culprits, that right the culprits. the culprits right so can you talk a little bit about about the culprits I mean uh, Onegin and the whole kind of Russian tradition of superfluous men yes. comes to mind yes, as, as, yes, as one yes. example of um, of that. Goethe and, and Werther, Breton, yeah. right? All of these. I mean, are these your, your main culprits of... Onegin, I'm afraid so. Yeah, I love that book. Like, I love it to pieces. I'm realizing that um, I read it in that crazy in translation, edition, which yeah. is um, yeah. often maligned, but I I'm just going to find Tatiana's letter while you talk. Oh, yeah, so, okay, so okay. Talking, yeah. So, um, and I, you know, one thing that I realized partly while I was doing, you know, because you write a book and you're just like, oh, I'm writing a book. And then you go and you have conversations <laughs> with like super smart people and you like think about it. And one thing that I realized as I was talking about The Idiot was that that book was really Eugene and Nagin fan fiction, that it was like, right, right. A, so Eugene and Nagin is, um, there's this young girl, Tatiana, who loves to read novels and she lives in the provinces and she, um, you know, her parents are a little bit overbearing and she doesn't really know anyone who's like cool or an intellectual. So she just reads books all the time. And then like this one guy comes from the big city uh, and that's Eugene Onegin. And she immediately, and he's read all the books and he's kind of done all the things and he's sort of over everything. Mm -hmm. And he's this like kind of this hipster. And, and Pushkin is extremely clear sighted about like, he's like, yeah, Onegin's fine. Like he, he he knows how to say the right things. He's read the right books. He's he's not he never says anything really stupid. But like he's kind of a parody. Like what what and then when Tatiana falls in love with him, Pushkin is like, oh Tatiana, I weep for you. You're putting your <laughs> heart into the hands of a modish tyrant. And like, but when you're reading it, you're not like, oh yeah, Tatiana, don't do that. I mean, you're kind of like Tatiana, don't do that. But you're always you're also like you know. I want her to do that because otherwise there would be no book. And if there was no book, you know, if there was no Eugene Onegin, you know, maybe the whole history of the Russian novel would be different and we wouldn't have Anna Karenina. And, mm -hmm. it, um, and, and also how would her life become the subject of this great literary work if she, if she didn't write this letter? It all starts mm -hmm. with she writes this inappropriate letter to Eugene Onegin, which right. is kind of the how The fact that I'm writing idiot. is yeah. already confessing, yeah. right, yeah. my love. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's supposed to be a, it's supposed to be a, a novel, or it's it's it has been received as a novel about this category called the superfluous man. But what I think I was droning on to Merve about at some earlier point in her acquaintance is that what it actually tells you is that the superfluous man is deeply necessary. He's like, it, it, he's, the book is named after him. 
Right, right. Well, and he's necessary for the ending, right, where she renounces him. Yeah. And she yeah, says, yeah, yeah, I yeah. choose my husband. Exactly, exactly. I choose my life. You can meditate on your bitterness for the rest I of yours, right? I choose my husband, my unhappy marriage. And my unhappy marriage. Yeah, my yeah. unhappy marriage to Yeah, but that is also an act of, I mean, that's kind of like the end of James, which, of yes, Henry James's yes. Portrait of a Lady, which, which your novel ends on. By, yeah. I, I found one person on Jay's store in the 60s who was like <laughs> this, Henry James read some translation of Onegin and was influenced by it, but I right. believe that. Well, we can come back to James a little bit. Could we talk um, about about uh, Breton? Because oh, yeah. that's another culprit for you, and, and Breton's, do we pronounce it Nadja or Nadia? How do people pronounce I it? I believe it's Nadja. Nadja, with a heart. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Uh, uh, Nadja, which which I, I keep finding in the in the works of our contemporaries, like Joanna Walsh's Breakup, huh. a great book, has a long uh, discussion of, about Nadja. Nell Zink's Avalon oh, feels yeah, like yeah, Nadja, yeah. Nadja's having a moment right now. So maybe it, it is a culprit for a whole generation yeah. of, of readers. Yeah, actually, I was doing an interview with someone who I think was like a, probably like your age, and he was like, I just have this question, like, why this terrible book? Like, yeah. why does she read it? And think about it but it was everywhere it was every and it, it had this like it wasn't this cover it was this handwritten cover that said Nadja Andre Breton and it was just text and it looked it didn't look like any other book it had photographs in it it was on every syllabus it was like all the cool people had it in their rooms it was just like a cool object that like you had to come to some kind of terms with or have some attitude towards mm. um so yeah probably yeah probably it's the the writers who are it was probably quite a small window and we're all getting to the age where we're starting to rethink this stuff. Well, but all of you are asking the same question that Céline asks toward the end of the book, which is, what is the relationship between traveling, mm -hmm. having sex, falling in love, and ruining other people's lives? Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're all interested in that question, and Nadja yeah. is also, I think, extremely, extremely interested, interested in, that. In, that, in that question. Yeah. She, yeah, she... I read this incredible book about her during the pandemic, which I now forgot because I read it in French and I do not remember anything that I read in another language, but it was like, it was her true story, her true story. And it was awful. She dies in a, she's institutionalized. She dies in a cholera epidemic in the, in World War II. She lives through World War I and she ends up in, in World War II in this like horrible, horrible place where the women are put in like ice cold bathtubs and left there all day. And they're like, mm -hmm. it's super unsanitary. And then they get cholera and starve to death. Right. Okay. Well, moving and, and on he, from and, that. And, and yeah. he never visits her. And he, he never, never visits, visits her. her. Yeah. Well, he gets bored with her. Yeah. Right. And I think that there's a connection there between what happens with Ivan and sit yeah. isn't there? That, the that, the, he gets bored, and once he gets bored, he doesn't feel like he has any obligation yeah, yeah. to her anymore. But maybe we should actually talk a little bit about Ivan mm -hmm. um, and Céline, because that relationship obviously changes a great deal mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. from the idiot. And a, a, a reviewer of the book, Sarah Chahaya, who's a friend of mine, pointed out that, you know, uh, Céline spends a lot more time in either or thinking mm -hmm. about Ivan and trying to understand mm -hmm. what happened rather than actually interacting with him, yes, right? They have yes. very few interactions yes. over email. I didn't know about fingering. Yeah, dark. Uh, on it's email, really dark. not, not, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and and so, so, yeah, so she's spending a lot of time thinking about him and in a very kind of, you know, Isabel Archer way where the mm -hmm. pieces start falling into mm -hmm. place yeah. of, of what of what happened. So how does that, how did you think about changing that relationship over the course of, you know, the, the move from the idiot to either or? You know, uh, one one kind of precipitating factor but in, in the passage that I read too was this feeling that I had when I was promoting The Idiot that for a, a vocal minority of readers, uh, they were really upset that Ivan and Céline did not have sex at the end of... Um, at the end of the idiot, it's a spoiler for anyone who's gonna. Well, I mean, I already spoiled it, right? <laughs> nothing and, happened. Yeah, nothing, yeah happened. nothing happened. So I had this feeling, like, and I, you know, in my own kind of, I guess because I'd written this, but I'd written the the draft of the book that became the idiot in my early twenties. So that period of my life, that first year of college, and that first relationship that the Ivan relationship is based on, was a part of my like mental furniture. It's something that I thought about a lot. I didn't really think a lot about the second year until I started to hear that particular. I don't want to say criticism, but it, it was it was voiced sometimes with with peculiar affect. You know, like one girl I remember was like, I was really frustrated and like she she was like angry. And mm. there was a New York Times review that you know it seemed like that reviewer was upset about it, and it, that was extremely confusing because 
I hadn't even thought about like, should they have sex? Like, and people were like, why did you decide this? And I was like, you know, I didn't decide anything. That's just how it happened. And then I was like, you know, now the New York Times is upset that I didn't have sex in my freshman year of college. Like, what a weird response. Like, how, what is happening? Well, but I, I think I, well, can I, can I venture a, yeah, a, the, yeah, a theory, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, so, so in the back of either or, you give us a kind of bibliography or, yeah. or notes, right? And yeah. one of the essays that you cite is Adrian Rich's great essay on compulsory heterosexuality. Yeah, exactly. And it seems to me that people's deep investment in exactly. heterosexual sex is an expression of that compulsory heterosexual heterosexuality exactly. they're just like why can't these two people yeah exactly get it on but and that, but it's, I didn't it's a defect realize that. if they don't yeah, yeah yeah I didn't realize that that's exactly what I came to realize partly through reading that essay which I had not read before I wrote the idiot but I read it afterwards that that and I started to remember going back to school the next year and I remember people saying did anything happen and I remember the kind of cognitive dissonance of having to say no, no nothing happened even though I was thinking like so much it happened, happened. Yeah. and how wrong that felt and how it felt like a failure. Like I felt that I had really failed at this, this encounter because I hadn't managed it. And I, I, that was a time of like, and whatever, you know, whatever, what you just said, whatever those readers and reviewers and whoever had internalized, I had internalized it too. And it led me on a specific path. And that path led to an emergency room in the South of Turkey. It led to a number of places that, you know, I, I could have bypassed, you know, like nothing horrible happened to me, but it would have been mm. better. I, I could have saved mm. some time. And I, I wanted to, I wanted to unpack how that happened and make it clear to myself and make it clear to other people also. Well, there are all the, well, there, I mean, there are all of these moments in the novel where Selin is thinking something that seems like, uh, it seems clear to us in 2022 is exactly. internalized misogyny, yeah. right? So when yeah. she makes herself come and she thinks, well, it was a clitoral orgasm, so it didn't count. Right. It was, so I knew that it wasn't, it was superficial and it wasn't really fulfilling and meaningful like a vaginal right. orgasm. Right. So can you, can you talk a little bit about how you went about crafting those moments? I mean, we were, yeah. we were, we were discussing a bit earlier about yeah. how it would have been, um, th those are risky moves yeah. because, because they could really alienate the reader yeah. from Selin yeah. by coming on too strong. Yeah. But at the same time, they feel absolutely necessary to making the you know, argument that I yeah. think the novel is making about yeah. the way we do internalize patriarchal norms and the way we do use them as instruction exactly. for our own lives, particularly if we went to school in the in the 90s, yeah. even in the early 2000s, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a gamble. Like when I decided not to put the essay in the second half of the book and to put all of the work in the novel, um, it's really a gamble that I am going to be able to get readers to, I can draw out of readers now the knowledge that's common knowledge in 2022 that was not common knowledge then and that readers are going to get it and that I don't need a separate explanation and this is something and we were just talking about this I, w I was I was kind of nervous about this so it turns out that a, a, a feature you can get as a service or I don't know what to call it a, as a writer now is a, is a sensitivity read um, but they don't call it that it's called an authenticity read because sensitivity read implies that people are oversensitive so so I, <laughs> I like how you're kind of like yeah. getting nervous, I'm getting nervous touching I'm getting your nervous. body yeah. I'm getting nervous I'm self-soothing because I have to get an authenticity reader for the book that I wrote about my own life experience but I I, I really wanted like a, a very woke Zoomer to read the book. And I, and I wrote a little note that I said, you know, this book was set in a toxic time when we were full of toxic ideas. And in a way, I, like, I wanted to represent that. I want to show how someone gets those ideas and where they lead her. Um, I don't want the reader to agree with all of those ideas. Um, but I want to know if at any point it seems like the conclusion that she makes, you don't have to agree with it and it could seem like repugnant to you, but like, does it make sense that she got there? And is there anything that's just so triggering and awful that you're just like, nah, I'm, I'm like shaken out of sympathy with this person and I can't go on. I want to know if there's anything like that. And so she was like, okay, like, I, I understand that you put a lot of things that are offensive in this book on purpose. So I, I don't know which things are on purpose and are not. So I'm just going to flag all of them. And then one <laughs> of the things that she flagged was... Um, the, the part about clitoral orgasm where she was like, no, this is not correct. I don't understand why does she, th like, it was like, <laughs> she's never heard of that. She's never heard of the, which was so, it was canon when I was growing up was right, that right. clitoral orgasm was different from and, and right. immature and like less, right. less complete right. than vaginal mm -hmm. orgasm. And she had just never heard of it. And I was just like, this is fantastic. This is <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was, but you kept it news. in. Yeah. I yeah. kept it in because I thought, you know, she, yeah, yeah, I kept it in. Her yeah. specialty was YA, and I thought maybe people who had read more would have come across that idea. <laughs> I mean, not who had read more, who had read more st stuff that... 
predated YA, which is quite recent. Right. Well, thinking about the rich essay, I mean, I'm, I'm so struck by the beginning of the rich essay, which basically starts by asking, uh, you know, reading these recent works of feminist theory and then says, you know, I, if, if most relationships are women to women relationships, you know, in the home, in the domestic, in the spaces where we start out our lives, yes. if most of them are women to women relationships, why on earth do we expend so much energy motivating ourselves and mm -hmm. others toward heterosexual relationships. Mm -hmm. This is weird, yeah. right? And it's amazing to see her frame yeah. it, yeah. frame it that way. And after I read the essay, reread the essay on the train down today, I was thinking about how much more interesting all of the women in your novel are, all of the friends are, than any of the men. So Svetlana, Lakshmi, uh, Riley, right? Um, and they seem to play a bigger role in either or than they did in The Idiot. So were you thinking about, about making this a kind of collective yeah. novel in a way? Because at times it almost feels like a, like a group novel, mm -hmm. you know, even oh, though Selin is the voice guiding yeah. us through it. Um, I, yes, thank you. Uh, I, when I read Compulsory Heterosexuality for the first time, which was very late, you know, it was around, obviously it was there when I was in college, but why didn't I read it? That was another question that I wanted to solve from this. Or, why you didn't know, you? Why didn't I? Yeah, I didn't take any feminist classes. I didn't right. know about, I knew about her poetry. I didn't know that she had this conversion. I didn't know she, you know, right, right. yeah, I didn't just didn't know anything. Um, and I, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't terribly curious or, the, you know, I was just so, I was so focused on art and the canon and, and a mode of of viewing literature that um, according to which literature couldn't be political or it would be tendentious and then it wouldn't really be artistic, like that, you know, this kind of valorized idea of objectivity, which I blame on several things. But, you know, since we're chatting, the, the Cold War, German romanticism, and also the relationship between my parents. Um, <laughs> it's a pretty thorough, yeah, thorough yeah, yeah. cast of culprits. Yes, yeah. yes. I wish we could stack all of those yeah, here on top oh my of God, these books, like, oh. too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, wait, there was a, so, yeah, yeah so the thing that I love about the rich essay is that it's like, she's like, yeah, we take it as, she finds some like throwaway quote in a, like Nancy Chodera, I don't know how to, like this yeah, feminist yeah, yeah, psychoanalyst, yeah. Lytic, so she's like, oh, of course m women's relationships with other women tend to be, she's talking about the frustration, the emotional frustration of marriage, heterosexual marriage for women, that women, oh, their emotional needs aren't met in the, in the, by their husband, so they typically have these close friendships, and then they have to have children, and the relationship with the child fills in the emotional depth that they didn't have with the husband, which of course is a burden on the child that then causes, you know, many problems later on in the child's life, and, uh, and then she has just kind of a side note, like women's relationships, with same-sex relationships don't usually have these problems, but that's not really relevant for us because the majority of women are heterosexual. And Adrian Rich was like, hmm. <laughs> you know, like, so she's like this thing that we take to be like natural or um, either, either it's, it's a natural orient biological orientation, you're born that way, or it's a free choice. It's a, you know, either way that you put it, she's like, it's, it's, what if it's neither of those things and there's actually a whole complex of forces that are working very, very hard to wrench women's energies away, not just in terms of sex, like not just in terms of like, oh, you're not supposed to be a lesbian, but turning women's energies away from themselves and from other women and redirecting them towards men. And that's what makes that essay so mind blowing to me. And when I read that, I was also, this was also something that I was thinking about during the promotion of The Idiot was how much more um, I did hear from a lot of young women who were in relationships with Yvonne-like people, but but I heard more people kind of were interested in Svetlana. And mm. I was just thinking when I wrote that book, I thought the A plot is Yvonne and Céline and the B plot is um, Céline and Svetlana. Yeah. Yeah. Thank just you. Put it up there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah it's an essay. Uh, um, and then I was like, why did I, why was that the B plot to me? Why wasn't that the A plot? Or was maybe that, was that the A plot? Or was the A plot the fact that that wasn't the A plot? And it was something that I really mm -hmm. wanted to address a lot more um, straight on in either or. So like in either or, I, I wrote a conversation between Céline and Svetlana where Céline is like, don't you think it would be easier if we just dated each other? And right. Svetlana is like, and then she explains all the reasons why they can't do it. And Celine's like, oh yeah, that's, I recognize that as usual, Svetlana was right. <laughs> and they kind of move on. Um, and as for the other women, yeah, they kind of, they kind of filled in, I don't know, like part of the, part of the story was that um, Celine and Svetlana, you know, 
like one thing that people asked me all the time after the idiot was like, oh, is Svetlana still your best friend? And I was like, you know, no, she's not. Like, we're not close like that the way that we used to be. And it, it made me realize that, you know, their friendship survives the idiot, but it, it's not going to survive either or. Like, it has to, something has to change. And this is now reminding me of the answer to the other question, which was like, why is Ivan's role different in the other book? And that was because it's it's like... The relationships don't just end like that, you know, There's, they have this whole long, at least in, in, in my experience, maybe I'm a, a crazy outlier, but like, you know, you have some intense emotional experience while the person's actually there. And then you have like a, at least equally intense relationship for three years after you haven't seen the person. And that, yeah. in a way that's like, so I wanted to have that. And, uh, and this book was really about, it was kind of staging the breakup between Selin and Svetlana and and part of that was that they're not roommates. And so that meant that Selin had to have another roommate. So that brought Riley into it. And then mm -hmm. Lakshmi came in another way. And yeah, and it's sort of... Yeah, I want to I wanna get back to something that you said about... Um, uh, I can't remember if this was in our, our, our uh, blame stack, but uh, was, the canon, was. was the canon in there? The canon, the Cold I mean, War, your parents, German idealism... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Romance, romance, it, yeah. I mean, those things. Yeah, definitely, those things formed the canon. Because I mean, not not the relationship with you know, with, with that <laughs> <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> um, because you know, it's it's interesting to me. I I I kind of thought that where the book would end, and I don't think this is giving anything away, I was sort of waiting for Henry James to pop oh, up wow, the whole yeah. time I was reading. And I thought, you know, like, okay, is the third installment, Salin's junior year abroad, yeah, yeah, yeah. going to be called Portrait of a Lady? <laughs> like, I, I was, oh, I was, I I was fully I prepared for that. Yeah. So it was obviously a delight when, you know, Selin in the final pages of Either Or <laughs> is reading Henry this James. Is the spoiler. At the end, she reads Henry yeah. James. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but he does emerge in in her consciousness then at least as a kind of hero mm -hmm. like he has he has has spied his young woman as he yeah, writes in the yeah, preface yeah. to Portrait of a Lady and his big question is what will she do yeah and his answer to that question is that she will think yeah she, she will, will yeah. simply think and he right? talks about the scene like I was gonna have her like I had to have her sitting in a chair and just thinking about stuff and like nothing external is happening because she's a you know if your heroine is a young woman then you know she can't do very dramatic stuff but I wanted to have the scene of her sitting in a chair be as exciting as like a pirate surprising some island or you know whatever right, it is right. which really it felt really good it felt like you know balm to the retroactive injury of like nothing happened like no something did happen like I thought a lot of stuff <laughs> well and and not only did did you or you know Isabel Archer think a lot of stuff but you know the end which takes us back to Onegin mm -hmm. I you know she has that incredibly sexually charged interaction with the perfectly named Casper Goodwood, mm -hmm. right? And feels mm -hmm. that hot flash of white lightning mm -hmm. strike her body. And then she walks away, mm -hmm. right? It's an exercise of her free will. At the end, mm -hmm. she goes back to her unhappy marriage, mm -hmm. but she does it knowing the conditions under which it was brokered, mm -hmm. right? So it's a decision that she's making with her eyes wide open oh, as opposed to yeah. with her eyes blinded. And so, I, I mean, I was thinking about that um, at the end, because the final lines, and again, I don't think this is giving anything away, is like, um, I, I had now stepped out of the script, mm -hmm. right? Selin seems to realize that part of winning her freedom will mm -hmm. be winning her freedom from literature, mm -hmm. of thinking that these plots are going mm -hmm. to be her life. So, you know, given what you said about the canon, it feels curious now that James emerges as a almost kind of heroic uh, heroic savior at the end of the novel, but maybe I'm reading that incorrectly. <sighs> James comes, you know, she reads Portrait of a Lady and she's very excited. And then she reads the preface, that James's preface, which, so James's prefaces were a big part of writing pedagogy in the US. And they were actually Mark McGurl in the program era. He writes about this. And then there's that book by that guy about the CIA and the creative writing program. There's Eric like five somebody. of them. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah, really, yeah, yeah. they're so really, they're interesting. Yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a time like the creative writing program. Bennett, Eric Bennett. Yeah, yep. the creative writing program in America, like the, the master's program in creative writing, came into being right after World War, you know, in the mid middle of the 20th century. But it really got this boom with the GI Bill when, you know, all these people had access to education. And there was this, um, people wanted to write stories of their experiences. And, but it was also during the Cold War. And there was some, and there were also, you know, people coming from different countries. There was a lot of mobility. And there was this kind of, like, state interest in not having people write too much, too, like, politically and too much about history. And also to make writing seem like a teachable craft. And for some reason, the thing that they landed on 
on was the prefaces of Henry James, where he talks about how he wrote his novels, and they and they were put together as a book, and this was like a sign. And, and the thing that so Celine at the end, she reads Portrait of a Lady, and then she reads this preface by Henry James, where he's like, I just I don't know where the germ of this story came to me. It was something some babbling fool of a woman told me at a <laughs> dinner party, and you know I I recognized that germ, and I took it out, and I I did all of the work that. Um, an artist has to do to surround it and to turn to elaborate it into the story, and then that's my novel. And Celine is kind of like, huh? Like, so what if? But like, I, I guess I don't have. And then he's like, I, how did I do that? Well, I don't know. Maybe if I trace the whole history of my whole life, then I could figure out how I did it. But like, I'm not going to do that. And then Celine's like, I'm going to do the thing where I trace the history of my whole life, and I'm right. the, I'm the young woman myself, so I don't have to like steal some germ from someone and then like you know say that they're stupid. And it was part of like a larger um, way of think. I, I've been thinking about Henry James. So some a larger thing that I've been thinking about in the past few years is why our novel is fictional. Why is that? Why you know in, in English in particular those the words arose at the eight, in the 18th century here and uh, wh why why is the defining feature of a novel that it's not it's not it, you know corresponding to referential reality like that just doesn't seem doesn't seem right that that's the defining right, feature right. and Henry James is a is a big part of that because he was like I I just take the germ and then I discard the rest and I elaborate and I use art and but Henry James could not write what he was really experiencing because he was gay. So he had to sort of translate, he had to translate the erotic energy and put it somewhere else into Casper Goodwood or, you know, whatever. And that was this, and then he had to have a story for himself about how it was actually better that way. And that's something that I've been thinking about a lot and rethinking and thinking that in a way, I don't know, Henry James was onto something, but he was also distorting himself in some way. And what if we don't have mm. to quite distort ourselves the way that Henry James does? And another thing I thought of is that Henry James, you know, that I take the germ and then I, I get to forget about the woman at the dinner party is also a way of, um, I think, assuaging one's own conscience for the fact that, you know, one is a writer and that lots of other people could be writers and maybe you're taking stories from other people who you were next to at a dinner party. You know, maybe that woman could have written the book herself, but he had to think, no, writers bring some added value. We need a cast of small elite group of like specially trained people who have special skills who can produce literature for the world. And then, and that's why we have to write fiction because they're not, obviously they're not writing about their, you know, they would all be writing about going to Oxford and Eton and whatever, and it would all be the same book. No, they have to be like Flaubert and be able to like, oh, I can go into the mind of a banal woman in the provinces, you know, like they have to be able to do all that mm, gymnastics. Yeah, yeah. But if we democratize the, the vision of who gets to write and who gets to tell their story, we come to this kind of like obvious but long overlooked, like overlooked by young me fact, which is that the people who are best equipped to tell the story are the people who know it the best, we're the mm. people who it happens to. Mm. So yeah, so it's, Henry James is a site of a lot of kind of, I think, Potential, conflicting. Yeah, conflicting. yeah. There's a, there's a real emancipation, yeah. and there's a you know there's a way that he that Isabel Archer is written with a kind of um, there's it's kind of a possibility of freedom, and and there's something really feminist about it. But then there's something that it didn't quite mm. go all the way mm. because everyone's a product of their time, you know. Right. Well, you've really inspired me to write my first novel about a Turkish American girl who goes to Harvard awesome. in 2003, as awesome. opposed to yeah, 1995. So. Uh, I have no idea how much time we have left because I have been enjoying this too much to look at my watch, well, but know, I think it's maybe it's different. time to... It's different. In I'm not going to do that. No. <laughs> no, but, I mean, you could because it's like our experiences are, I'm sure they're really different. Like it's easy to look from the outside and be like, oh yeah, those two people. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, when I walked in today, someone was like, hello, Elif, and I was like, no, I'm the other one. <laughs> um, how much time do we have? How are we on time? Should I turn to audience Q&A? Someone. I've got some questions from cyberspace. If, oh, yeah. if okay. you're ready for uh, we questions, we are. Um, so, should we prioritize people in the room or people on? I guess. I guess. Well, you have them already. Okay, the people in here can think, people think people up, think up your questions, people in the room, while we answer the virtual ones. Okay, uh, first one from cyberspace, <laughs> which has just disappeared. Is this person's <laughs> name cyberspace? Or uh, they, no, no they have person's a name. name is anonymous. Oh, okay. okay. Ooh. That's my favorite person in cyberspace. <laughs> so actually. Um, um, does Elif think about writing a novel about Turkey? Yeah, she does. She does. Um, <laughs> I was writing. A, uh, I was working on a bunch of books at the same time, and one of the books that I was trying to write was. Um, it was actually how. 
I started writing it during 2016 during the coup attempt. I don't know why I'm like pointing to you, like you know. Because I know, yeah, yeah I know, you know, I know. I didn't participate in it. Yeah, but I know yeah, yeah. It. Of yeah, course, yeah. you were responsible <laughs> for that. We all. But um, and I was just thinking about. I had left. I had been living in Istanbul, and I had left during the Gezi protests. I left at this really optimistic moment, and then everything just went to shit, and it, it was really depressing. And I was just thinking about the way that my view. So I learned Turkish in 1980. <coughs> um, it's not your first language. It's not my first not language. First yeah, language. my parents went to American schools and they and they really believed if you teach the kid different languages, they'll get confused. And they were like, yeah. you know, she has to succeed in America. And um, so I learned Turkish when I was three, when my mom sort of parked me with her parents so she could study for the medical board <laughs> exams. And, same. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, incredible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, keep going. Wow. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, yeah. Wow. We both have parents who are doctors. Yeah, who, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's yeah. tough. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. yeah. So then I, that was when I learned Turkish. And I remember, I kind of remember that because then I couldn't go back, right? I was just supposed to go there for two weeks, but then the airports closed and all this stuff happened. And I was there for several months with my aunt. And I remember that time. Like, I remember not being able to go back. And I remember asking about the coup. And I remember what I was told at that time, that it was, like, basically a good thing. And then um, how that understanding has changed over the years. So I started to write a book that was going to be just like all the different times that I interacted with Turkey or visited Turkey or reconsidered mm -hmm. Turkey and how it changed over the years. And I got bogged down. But actually when I was, I think because I felt like I had to explain too much stuff, I have... I kind of feel like because I, you know, I used to write for the New Yorker in Turkey about Turkey. Like, so sometimes people talk to me as if I'm an expert and I don't know anything, anything. And right. it's so scary. It's like, yeah. you, no, there's no. so potential, it's a minefield. You can just insult so many people horribly without realizing it. Um, but somehow something about getting back in the mindset of Selin, where she's just like, she's not trying to explain anything yet. She's just like noticing that the different things don't add up. I think if I that actually I've started to think that maybe I'm going to try to revisit that novel from the perspective of Céline, where she's like, mm. I saw this thing in 1980 and I saw this thing at this time and this thing at that time and then how mm. do they add up? And then that could kind of like free me from judgment, from having mm. to make judgments. I do love how Céline translates Turkish idioms the way that, oh, yeah. the way that estranged uh, yeah. exiles or emigres do, like yeah. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. favorite one in our family is um, patlajan, patlajan, patlasan senin kojan, which literally translates as eggplant, eggplant, may your husband explode. <laughs> Under what circumstances do you say that? I don't know. My mom says it all the time. I'm not sure. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Should we take a question in yeah. here and then we can alternate anonymous cyberspace and embodied people? Yes. Um, I just wanted to like relate back to what you were saying about um, sexual assault in the book. Um, and I sort of, I guess, think about the way you wrote about mental health. Um, when I was reading The Idiot, it was my first year of university, and I really identify with the sort of like dissociated way that Selin writes. Um, and then in lockdown, I was like, oh, I think I actually might just be depressed. That's why I feel so dissociated. <laughs> um, and it's interesting in this book, she kind of has like a similar experience. It feels very second year experience to realize you might be depressed. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that it sort of happens is in that same way. And I read that you got a lot out of therapy, and I did as well. But in the book, psychologists are portrayed in a sort of ambivalent, negative way. Um, I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about writing about mental yeah. health in the book. Yeah, I would not have been able to write either this book or The Idiot without the benefit of many years of therapy, which I... I I had pretty much the experience of Selin. I try. I, I did realize I was depressed. I always went to psychiatrists rather than psychologists because my parents are MDs and I wanted meds and I just thought that that was the way to do it. I did not have any great results from, from my interactions with psychiatrists, with psychiatry. Um, it was when I started to see someone who had, a, you know, like a PhD and more, like, I, I don't know. I just like, I understood his, his background better. Um, that really helped me. I lost, I was able to lose like tremendous amounts of shame and self-hatred that I didn't realize that I had with, without which there's no way I would have been able to. And that's how I was able to edit The Idiot and turn it into, because I had written it at the time, at a time when I was really ashamed of like all the mistakes that I'd made and you know, how I'd kind of like thrown my heart at this guy who was like ultimately not that interested in it. It was it felt deeply, deeply shameful. And after the therapy and after, you know, many years of life, which also has sort of a therapeutic effect, I was able to just see it more as like 
this is just a product of how of, of I had this really specific formation and background, which, you know, you also don't realize. That's another thing you realize through therapy. You're like, yeah, I'm a person in the world. And then, you know, it's through intensive, intensive conversation, you realize like, no, I got these very particular inputs that not everyone got. And I got them in this particular order. And that's why I thought these things that made me act in this way. And there's actually nothing to be ashamed of, which was kind of like a, a motivating way of writing either or. I wanted to write like, this is what this is what she heard, this is what she read, this is what she saw that made her, that gave her these particular conclusions. And the reason that she doesn't have a good experience with mental health in either, or actually, you know, I was going to have an essay at the end that, you know, that was going to be in the essay part that like later I went to therapy for, the, I didn't, it didn't click for me until I was 37, that, that 37 I benefited from therapy, started benefiting mm -hmm. from therapy. Um, and I, I wanted to, you know, why, why didn't I benefit? You know, like I knew about lesbianism, I knew about feminism, I knew about therapy, I knew about all of this stuff, but something about it, the way that it was presented or the way that I encountered it made me think that it wasn't for me and that was what I wanted to restage. Um, so I, I hope that people don't get the message from that, that I'm anti-therapy, which is why I kind of lead with the like, I love therapy whenever <laughs> I'm in front of a room of people, just in case. One of the, can I just connect that to the point about sexual assault, which is that one of the things that I found intensely relatable in Céline's descriptions of those assaults is the way that when that happens to you, sometimes your first impulse is to feel shame and try to feel shame on behalf of the person who mm. is acting aggressively toward you. And then you try to like protect them yeah, you try from to that shame them. as well, right? You feel pity, you feel shame, you try to smooth it all over. You feel like by yeah. having your subjective experience, you're accusing them. This, yes. is some, this is like a animating state of my earlier life is that by subjectively describing just my experience of life, it's this dire accusation against other people, like my parents or, you know, which it's not. Nobody did anything. Like I honestly think that an either or, nobody did anything wrong. Like even, even that kind of rapey guy, like he, he had his own inputs, you know, like it, yeah. no one's, no one's, no one's a bad, like, I don't even know if there's a such thing as a, but I, yeah, that's just. Yeah. Should we online or <laughs> do you I, have any more cyber? I've got alternate? it online. If there's not another one immediately. Oh, I have one over there. Let's do online after. Hello. Um, I knew there was a like amount of shared experience with yourself and Celine before tonight, but maybe not quite so much. Um, I was wondering why you chose to create a character for her rather than just use yourself in a more autofictional manner. Yeah, so I, this is similar to a question I get a lot, which is if it's so close to you, why didn't you just write a memoir? Um, it's I have a bunch of thoughts about genre on the on you know. First of all, as I was saying before, I I don't remember. It, it's it's an imaginative reconstruction of a mental state of my earlier mental state, and that involved, you know, like I read while I was writing this book. I read Freud's Dora. I reread Nadja. I reread Swan's Way, and it wasn't necessarily that I remembered having read that book at that particular time. I, with Dora, I did remember, but I don't think I read Proust then. And it was it was kind of like, but I, I wanted to have that because I was very conscious of myself now as someone who's benefited a lot from Proust and as someone who was driven crazy by Proust the first time I tried to read him. And I don't really remember when that was or how that was or why that was. So it was about, you know, reading those things and trying to like reconstruct what I remembered about um, you know, conversations that I had and how I might have felt about them at the time. It's just stuff that I don't completely have access to anymore. That was one reason. Another reason is um, there's me, right? And I'm quite truthful about myself. Um, it's a little bit stylized. I mean, I think that Céline, like one thing that I really wanted to do with this book was to invite readers to question, you know, how much of what we take to be like human nature or the way of the world is like some bogus rule that some guy made up and that we all, so I, uh, I just, you know, that, that, that thought just sent me on a whole, um, I lost my, so wait, why isn't it a memoir? I wanted to reconstruct why there's me and then there's the other people in the book. Well, I don't remember what I was going to say, but another reason is that, um, I feel like with a memoir, it's, um, 
like you write, like people do memoirs, like I actually hiked this like 30,000 mile road. We know like where you're trying to draw attention to the fact, to the fact, the facticity of it matters. It matters that this is true and that this is something that a person did. I don't feel that about this book. Like I don't think any of those things are that important. I don't feel like my experience needed to be like memorialized by having a book about it. The thing that I wanted to reproduce was the subjective journey of having certain thoughts. And I, it was very important to me that those thoughts be precipitated in a realistic way. And to the extent that I didn't make stuff up, it's because I didn't want to cheat. You know, like one question that I got is like, well, why doesn't Satan just become a lesbian? And the answer is because, well, clearly she couldn't have because I didn't. If it was possible, I would have done it. You know, like the thing, and I want to show how a person was in those circumstances could not, you know, that could not happen. So it was kind of an experiment to reconstruct that. And then another reason why it's a novel is because, um, Unfortunately, when you write in a personal way about your own life, you have to write about other people too. And if it's a memoir, you're really dragging in kind of like other people in a way that if it's a novel, you can kind of, the other people can be kind of, the other characters can be a little bit more composite or a little bit, you can keep it a little bit more fuzzy. And mm. yeah, that was another consideration. I, I would maybe just add, and I'm stealing from my friend Tim Buse, who has a great book about this coming out called mm. Free and Direct, mm -hmm. that fictionality <laughs> need not be the essence of the novel I, and I that in that fact yeah, yeah yeah and that in fact many of the people who are writing the most interesting novels today are people who resist mm -hmm. precisely that link between fictionality and the novel like Gerald Murnan for instance is one of my favorites. it's always been like that yeah. like it's yeah. like to say that I don't know, like Anna Karenina, he wrote a first draft of Anna Karenina and it was supposed to be like a, a pure novel that was a commentary on the Dumas, the lady with camellias. And it was, it's like not good. It's like, she's this fat woman who's full of life and lustful. <laughs> and uh, it's called Maladiets Baba, which is like, you go girl in, in <laughs> Russian. And, like, and then it's like, he added the character of Levin, who's basically Tolstoy and has his experience. And he's in some kind of, he doesn't meet Anna until the end, which is then this mind blowing moment when they finally meet but their, their lives are connected in all of these different ways. And it's clearly just his experience. And it's like putting that in the book grounded it and made him able to write about her as a human being. Like if you're not situated in the book in some way, it's like, I mean, some people can do it, but I, I find it extremely challenging to like relate to other people from, as someone other than myself. Um, yeah. Should we take a question from Simon? Uh, I've got one here for Merve, actually. A question right. from Kathleen Engman. I would love to hear Merve speak a bit about how whether her earlier work on personality types, Myers Briggs, and its extremely American perspective, is connected to her life in international literature, including but not limited to this conversation. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't want to take the spotlight off of Elif. So maybe, uh, Kathleen, I apologize. You should just send me an email and I can tell you my life story uh, uh, through that. Yes, 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 exactly. Another yeah, one right. from Anonymous. Oh, I think it may be a different Anonymous. <laughs> um, Wait, both. shouldn't we switch to the room? We're alternating, but aren't we? we didn't really get a question from Cyber. I know. <laughs> I, okay, all right. To both. Okay. Um, favorite book read of this year so far? Favorite book? Favorite, favorite book, book or read, read. Oh. this year, yeah. Um, Either or by Ellen. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think for, I'm, I'm just, I just finished this novel called The Eighth Life that, uh, by Nina Haratashvili, which was recommended to me by a brilliant member of the audience. And uh, it's, it's incredible. It's this, uh, I read it as an ebook, so I can't tell how monstrously long it is, but it's monstrously long. And I got to the end and I immediately had to start reading, rereading it from the beginning mm. again. And it's about this, it's a multi-generational um, family saga that starts in Georgia. So it's a Georgian family and the, the first person is kind of born in like 1900 and the, it goes through the 20th century. And it's, it's really fascinating for the, the relationship <coughs> of Georgia and Russia that like some of the people in the book are really pro-Russian and some are anti-Russian. And then the, you know, one of them becomes this like super powerful nomenclatura guy. And yeah, it was just incredibly, mm. uh, th there's ballet people and the ballet people are, have their own mm. relationship with it. Yeah. Uh, so I had to read 137 novels for the oh, booker, for that. the booker. Yeah. yeah. And, and right over there on that wall, you can see that the International Booker Prize long list has been crossed out and replaced with a short list. So I'll just go ahead and I'll just go ahead and recommend everything that is on our short list uh, because they are all wonderful, wonderful, wonderful novels. And one short story collection. Sweet. 
Um, this is a deeply stupid question, so apologies in advance. But um, <laughs> I haven't finished reading the new one, but I was, towards the end of The Idiot, I was deeply touched by, um, and un unfortunately related to a passage that kind of said something along the lines of, you know, when Ivan, uh, and they parted ways, it, like, it felt like he took the story and left, and she, like she was living sort of, you know, days which didn't bring her closer to anything. Like mm -hmm. this kind of idea that, we're not seen unless we're perceived by the other, and that other is usually, as we've, you've touched upon, it's like this mm -hmm. man. Um, and how does one grapple with that in fiction and in what you're mm -hmm. writing? It's just, mm -hmm. it seems inevitable, even from what I've read, like you can still sense that desire within the character, it feels like. Sorry, yeah, I mean, this is an idea that is, it's, it's in The Idiot, and, but I, I wasn't really super conscious of it. It's something that, um, so there's this, at the end, Yvonne gives Céline the sense that her life is a story, and that that sense is really valuable to her, and it rescues her from some kind of meaninglessness of childhood where she feels like she's someone else's accessory, and now she gets to be like the heroine in a story. And then when Ivan disappears, he takes that sense of story away from her, and she's, you know, she's come to Hungary to be with him, and now he's gone, and, but there are all these other people there, and she's like, wait, on what basis am I even interacting with these people? And I, I didn't really think about what that meant, but it's, you know, after having read Compulsory Heterosexuality, I was, uh, when I started Either Or, I was a lot more mindful of the sense that um, the extent to which a relationship with a man is what has the power to turn a woman's, a young woman's life into a story. Her experience, and it's like, like in Eugene and Yegan, like Tatiana's life became a story because she met this guy and, you know, did this kind of, from a personal standpoint of kind of very risky and expensive emotional proposition. Um, and, and where do we go from there? I mean, I think I actually feel very optimistic about this. I, yeah, I, I learned a lot from Céline Siama, the filmmaker Céline Siama, who did the movie Portrait of a Lady on Fire, and the new one is Petite Maman. Uh, I, I wrote about her for The New Yorker a few uh, months ago, I guess it came out. Um, but she has been, she's a lesbian filmmaker, and she is really consciously revising the tropes of narrative and just the, f the structure of narrative, how it works, which is not really intuitive, you know, because when I first, you know, I thought, oh, a love story is a love story. It's, you know, yeah, we were used to a man and a woman, but it'll be two women and it'll be basically the same. But, you know, it, no, it can be, it can be really different. Like it, you know, conflict could be ruined for me. It could be more about design. The, the pacing could be different. And then, you know, there's a whole world of things that aren't romantic love. Like there's, there's so much more, like if, if we were looking at, at our lives as if the, subject matter could be something else besides that if we weren't trying to fit it into that cookie cutter. Um, yeah, as I think we're beginning to do, I think we're just at the beginning of this hugely exciting mm. process. Could I offer you a suggestion of something to read? There's a wonderful essay by Ralph Waldo Emerson called Love. And the question the essay is trying to answer is what do we do about the fact that passion fades, that the objects of our affection change and that this is painful? And the way Emerson tries, I think, to redeem this is he says that what love is really about, that, that perceiving that you just discussed, right? That's a perceiving that happens in you as a subject as well. That what love does is it inaugurates you into a kind of amorous seeing mm. and it activates these distinctly aesthetic capacities, right? It sets your imagination on fire. It sharpens your mind. It lets you project your pleasure in another person onto the world in such a totalizing way. But that is a power that resides within you, not within the person who leaves you in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And that's what you can take away, right, from the experience, even once the object of it, the beloved object, has, you know, run off to Stanford to do a PhD or whatever. Yeah, yeah I love that. I love that. And another, another way that I was thinking about this in either or is the relationship between the imprisonment of childhood is something that I was much thinking about. The extent to which everyone's childhood is kind of this like, it's a trauma. It's a traumatic experience, even if you grow up in very happy, non-abusive. Of course, it's much worse if you grow up in unhappy, abusive circumstances. But it's like, it's uh, the way that we relate to children. We don't completely view them as people. As adults, we don't view our childhood selves as, as fully autonomous agents. And I, I just became conscious of romance as the sort of, the minute that you get out of childhood, like romance is the thing that that is like, 
oh, if I do this, then I won't be a kid anymore. And it's, I, you know, I've been rereading Tolstoy and I've been really conscious, like in War and Peace, it's for the girls, it's romantic love, and for the boys, it's war. And they, they lead the people to trouble, you know, the romantic love that, that Natasha throws her, you know, she, first she marries this preposterous, she, she elopes with that, Kurag, she elopes with Kuragin, and then she, and then she, you know, becomes her own mother. And, you know, Petya, you see all the little boys and they're like, uh, their parents are driving them crazy and they're very loving parents, you know, but they're driving them nuts. And you see the scene where Petya is like, I'm going to join the, whatever, the hussars. And his, his dad is like, what are you talking about? Your mother's milk hasn't dried on your lip yet. And you're talking about joining the hussars. And Petya's like, okay, now I'm really joining the hussars. <laughs> you know, it's like, there's this infantilization and deprivation of agency that we're trying to fix through like smoking and drinking and love and uh, all of these things. But like, we don't have to do all those things to be alive and to be free. You know, there's other ways of being alive and being free. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I'm... That was a lovely, that was a lovely question. This is a lovely question. Okay, shake your neck. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, one in the corner over there. Um, thank you. Uh, I was struck by the kind of repeated references to either having children or not having children that kind of come through the novel and especially like Celine's sort of quite strong feelings about about um, bearing children and I was wondering whether you could speak a bit more about that just kind of in terms of maybe linking back to the idea that which we've been talking about through the whole evening of of a 2022 gaze on a 1996 perspective or kind of reality. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah that's a that's an interesting subject too. I think in either or Celine is you know probably as a as a product of the many fine years of therapy that I enjoyed as a, you know, adult with enough money to pay for therapy. Uh, Celine is very conscious of um, the way that her existence burdened her mother. And, um, and that's something that she's really grappling with throughout the book is like, what, what obligation does that put on her? And what, how is she going to metabolize it? And, and what, like, what's the plan? Like, there's a part early on in the book where she's like, she suddenly realizes that, like, it's never been clear to her why exactly people have to have kids. And they're like, very, you know, different stories about it. Like, oh, it's so that you have someone to take care of you when you're older. And she's like, no, that can't be right. Or like, oh, it's because like, you feel great love. And she's like, well, but couldn't you feel love for something else? Or like, oh, it's because like, you know, God needs you to have children so that you outnumber the people from the other religion. And she's like, but then what? And like, it, and she can't find like a satisfactory answer. And then she's like, oh, okay, I'm going to go to Harvard. And there I'm going to meet like truly enlightened people who have like this broader perspective. And then she gets to Harvard and like, she's been there for like 10 minutes and she's like, oh my God, all these people want to do is like make money and have children. Like, she's just like, I want another purpose for life other than making money and having children, which becomes this loop because she's, she notices like, you know, whenever she says to adults, like, oh, do you ever think about, you know, like just going to China or whatever, you know, people are like, I can't do that. I have kids. I have a mortgage to pay. So there, it's like this cycle. And like, then, you know, when white collar criminals, when they get caught, the first, they're always like, I did it for my family. And then it's like, okay, so why did you have the family? So that you then have to like steal stuff. Like, and nobody's talking about it. And it's like, it contributes to the sense that she has that like, you know, she's going to this, that she's, she's invested so much and her mother has invested so much to go to Harvard and for her to go to Harvard. And it means so much to like, why aren't they going to teach me how to live? Like, why aren't they going to teach her how, like, um, yeah. And that's a question that she's, that she's constantly wrestling with. And, um, I, you know, there's a biological window and there's financial considerations and I, I didn't solve it myself. So I'm not going to bear children. So that's something that I'm bringing to, you know, that's 2022 me is aware of that 1996 me was not aware of. Um, yeah, but it's 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 okay. <laughs> you can you know you can like it's another thing where it's like it channels you into romance and into love, but there's like so many ways to have love and there's so many ways of course you want to like give to younger people and of course you want to feel connected to younger people and you want to feel connected to the next generation and you want to have some stake in what's going on. But like there's so many ways to do that other than bearing a child. Although bearing a child is also wonderful. It's just like there's just Everything's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Should we take, how are we on time? Should we take one more maybe? No one will tell me what time it is for some it's, reason. It it's is 8, 12. 11 minutes past eight. Okay, let's take maybe two more questions. Yeah, I've got nothing yeah. you haven't You've covered. You've got nothing. We got no one anonymous space, online, so. so you people in this room are going to have to raise your hands you. and ask questions. There's yeah. one. Thank you. 
So I was interested in the childhood friend Leora who crops up in this book because the book is narrated from the perspective of an adult who's, or in some ways narrated from the perspective of an adult who's looking back on her college years. But at the same time, Celine is looking back on this childhood friendship because she has a childhood friend who pops up again in her college years. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering sort of what is the utility in terms of point of view of the Leora character? Hmm. That's an interesting question. What is the utility of the point of view for the Leora character? I mean, Leora is there as a childhood friend who has... So a lot of this book is about, you know, at the end when Céline, it's like she finally she's free from the scripts and she can leave the scripts. It's not just the canon. It's definitely the canon is a part of it. But it's also she's, she's going through the world and she's constantly um, like interrogating what are the different scripts that people are following and one very minor thread like this is not what the book is about at all but she she has some Jewish friends and she notices that her Jewish friends are following this very particular script that they and that's Leora is one of them and she there's certain questions that Céline is asking that Leora isn't asking I mean why so why is it important that she's from childhood and she didn't just meet her there I guess you know because she also knows she also knows her mom so another question that I was asking myself was the extent to which children like Céline is conscious when she gets to school that like everyone here is on a has a different deal it's you know like different people have different scholarships and they pay for a different amount of stuff and it's like it's not just the people who have scholarships who are on that literally everyone is here on like a different plan and like you know some people have like a repayment plan where you have to like pay back the cost of your college other people are like you have to visit constantly but like there it's like everyone has some different arrangement of like what they're expected to do and 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 how do they know that? And how are those expectations made known? And then how does it become known to the individual people that the different parents have different expectations? And I think Leora comes up a few points in the book to be like, I don't know, like I think Leora, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a bunch of kind of specific ad hoc things. I think at some point, Leora, she remembers Leora telling her as a kid, you're, it's because you're an only child, it's because you're an only child. And that was, related to something that was happening at some later point in the book. So it's like, I guess she just needed some, some to remember that she was already aware of some other script existing, even in the past. And that like, that's kind of the advantage of having someone from her childhood there. Now that you said this is not what it's really about, someone's going to write like a, a, yeah, a thought yeah. think piece or yeah. a yeah, this no, dissertation I don't chapter on I don't it. Need that. Nobody needs that. <laughs> Anybody else? No, we'll take two more because Susan. because you recommended the book. Yes. 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 Hi. Um, I'm sorry to go back to the kind of writing about your own life question, but um, it was really nice hearing you talk so kind of frankly about how much it was based on your own experiences because I found a kind of tendency <laughs> recently with particularly female writers to kind of quite actively distance themselves from that. And I think the main reason is it's a kind of affront to the classic thing of like men's novels are about life and the mm. universe and, and women's novels are about their own experiences. and. You know, I'm reading some interviews with authors who kind of, even though their experiences that they share with the characters in their book kind of quite, you know, actively try and put distance and say, it's not about me. And it, I was sorry, this is quite convoluted, but going back to what you were saying about, um, what was it like, weaponized objectivity and German romanticism and the kind of, I wondered if you thought that was also related to how women might not want to admit that their books are biographical because of this kind of impulse to be objective and universal. Yes, there's that. There's uh, women, there's all kinds of reasons not to admit that your book is autobiographical. It's, um, it's devalued. It's, yeah, it's viewed, it's gendered. It's viewed as a, like a lazy thing that women do or like a, you know, emotional obsessive thing that women do. It's viewed as less artistic that the, yeah, the German romanticism comes into it because as an artist is supposed to be someone who's like divinely inspired and isn't, you know, a mere stenographer or isn't derivative and doesn't derive things from life. There's also vast amounts of social prohibition against um, don't air your dirty laundry, don't, you know, discretion, don't, uh, there's, there's a lot of, and then, you know, 
I can tell you this, you go on book tour and you sit in rooms in front of large groups of people and they're like, so how much of this book is true? Was there really a person like this? Then, you know, if there was a person like that, you immediately start to get worried about that person. It's, it's nerve wracking. And I, uh, I, I understand because I have the same response when I read books, I want to know what's true. And I, I understand where those questions come from. My hope for the world is that, um, you know, I guess what I what I what I what question I ask myself here's okay. There's I have so many different thoughts about this. You know, when you meet writers, um, which is something that like I started to do after I was writing. You know, you go to book festivals and you'll be in a room, and and if you bring up the subject, it's like everyone in the room will be like, "Can't write this book yet. Waiting for me mom to die." You know, like <laughs> everyone is protecting someone. What or accent? Covering up something. What was that? I don't know. You what know, accent I don't know where was the that? Was from, what but, accent like, was that? <laughs> It wasn't an accent. It sounded like you were trying to do like James Joyce, like waiting for my mom to die. To yeah, you sense. know, I mean, James <laughs> Joyce made up a lot of stuff to protect yeah, people. Yeah, no, it's no. like, it's, there's a huge amount of censorship. I was, I was talking to a friend of mine who was, we were having this really emotional email exchange actually about this book. And she was like, you know, I, one of my regrets in life is that I didn't become a writer and I haven't written anything. And I was like, you and I should write a book together. Let's write a book together. Even what we've been writing now, like we can turn this into a book. I know exactly how to do it. And she was like, no, I, you know, I can't do it because of, and then she listed like three people who she had to protect, like three relatives of hers. Like it, it, as a result, we're like, what is the secret that we're all keeping? I think to me, this comes, this all comes down to, to shame that there's shame at exposing yourself and there's shame at exposing other people because it's, it, we feel like it's like the thing that you were just saying, like you put yourself, if I just dis sub describe my subjective experience, I'm going to be throwing all these other people under the bus because, you know, maybe someone made me feel bad. Maybe, you know, th you know, in the 1985, my mom said something that made me upset, but like, there's actually, if you think that there's actually nobody did anything wrong and there's nothing to be ashamed of, and shame is this like bad this feeling of personal this false feeling of personal badness that attaches to things that's only sustained by secrecy it's sustained by the fact that we don't know the true stories about you know everyone has all of these things everyone has them and if, if everyone was honest with them we we wouldn't have to be ashamed and as a result of the shame our books are full of lies. They're full of, you know, they're full of things that didn't actually happen. They're, they're composite characters. People like kind of make things up. And I, I tried to do that for many years and I was just not able to do it. And my first instinct, I mean, I actually remember doing an event with Deborah Treisman and someone in the audience was like, asked some question about Yvonne or Svetlana and she was trying to cover for me and like I, I kind of hedged and then she was like, but Elif, didn't you tell me that actually that character is completely fictional and invented? <laughs> and I could tell that she was trying to do something really nice and to protect me in this way, but I felt it, it, was, a, it was a troubling moment because I was like, why does protecting me involve my pretending that I made all this stuff up that I couldn't possibly have made up? And it's, it's so now I'm trying to be honest with it and I, I you know, at least to the extent that it affects me, you know, like I don't want to be super forthcoming with other people's true stories, but like with my own, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to hide and I think it's important not to actually. Should we take the last question? No, no, now you have to, we can't end on no, it's all right. It's fine. Come, come ask the last question and then let's. <laughs> I won't. I can't take the pressure, but I, I was wondering. Um, I was wondering about. I, I was wondering whether. I was wondering whether, whether you'd give this book to someone going to university now, you know, and whether they'd end up using it like as a manual for their life and in, in some mm. way. And I was just wondering how you felt about that. But obviously, that's for whoever is going to give the book to decide. So, but I, I was love just. That I think that's a fantastic it's question. A fantastic that's a great question. question to end on. Yeah, that's. A great it's a question. fantastic question, and I thought about it so much. Like the point of having an essay at the end was sort of to be like, um, so I could explain to people, please don't use this as a manual, because this was actually an issue that I had a little bit with the idiot, where I would get emails from people who were like, I'm in a relationship exactly like this with Yvonne, like, <laughs> and. Uh, I got an email from one girl who was like, my boyfriend and I both read this book. Well, he's not really my boyfriend, but we both read the book and we emailed each other from, you know, as Sidin and Yvonne. And then, you know, then he left and he had another girlfriend. And I was like, well, of course he did. You know, of course he did. And I, and then she's like, and I, you know, I was feeling bad about it, but now I feel better because I feel like I'm living an aesthetic life. And I was like, okay, just like, just, I'm writing a sequel. Don't go anywhere. Just like stay in the house. I'll, be, I'll have it soon. I'll like send it to you. And 
one thing that I was thinking about a lot, it's, and you brought this up too, like at the end of, of Portrait of a Lady or at the end of Eugene Onegin, the heroine is kind of like realizes like, oh, this thing was bullshit, but like I'm gonna, either I'm gonna walk away or I'm, like it, I've been thinking a lot about advice, that, like I said at the beginning, with advice, um, the idea that you have to make your mistakes yourself, which is a very 90s idea and it's, it's an idea that I really had and I certainly ignored vast quantities of good advice. And something that I've been wondering now that I'm in my 40s is to what extent was that advice even potentially takeable? Like, was it actually, was there a way that it could have been presented to me that I would have taken it? And I, I've been thinking about the relationship of that question to novels. There's this essay by Rene Girard that I think about a lot <clears throat> called about the end, the the unity of novelistic conclusions, where he's basically like, every novel in the world has the same ending. And he's, he's just talking about a subset of the canon, but, but it, it's, it's a lot of novels where he's like, the, the no, well, here's what the novel's about. It's someone who has some delusional idea. They really want something. They think that thing is really cool. They like go through all of this work to get it and to do the thing. And then they realize that it's stupid and then they die. And, <laughs> and this is so great because they realize the vanity and illusion of all of the things that they've been chasing. And they, their death actually transcends life and it's, it's super Christian, and every book tells you the, the message of Christian renunciation. And I just remember reading that and being like, well, if that was true, like, couldn't you just read one novel? Like, why do you have to read them all, like over and over again? Like, it, well, because they're, they're, not, they're not meant to teach you that, right? They're not meant to teach you, oh, don't write a letter like Tatiana, and don't do that with Eugene Onegin, or they're not, you know, like, I mean, I guess crime and punishment is like, it's kind of like, don't murder a pawnbroker, but like, <laughs> but, but like, you know, in search of lost time, that it's like he all he wants to do is do social climbing. Don't go climbing. to bed early. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't. Well, all he wants to do is social climbing and like go to parties. And at the end, he's like, oh my God, parties are stupid. I should have just been writing my book, but now I'm so sick I might die. Hope I don't die before I finish my book about how bad parties are. But like, do you read that? And are you like, oh, I guess parties are really stupid and I should just stay and read my book? Because you're not, because he's like, oh, because actually all these stupid parties had given me the content of my great book. And I don't know. So I, I, I wanted to play with that and I wanted to write, I mean... I don't know to what extent it's it's possible um, and to what extent I was able to do it, but my goal in this book was to write, like I wanted to show her doing things that I now think are wrong. I wanted to make it feel plausible as you read it that like a reasonable good faith person would actually do these things and it's not like, you know, it's not just this cartoonish person who's set up to do like wrong, stupid things. I wanted it to be like readable and funny and engaging, but I wanted the person at the end to be like, oh, those were wrong things to do and I would not do those things. And I, I thought that the loophole that would let me get to that is the time gap, is that, you know, mm -hmm. reading it now, we, can, we, have the ben we all have the benefit of hindsight of like, yeah. Oh, sorry, no, no, finish, finish, finish. Oh, yeah, and then I was so I guess, you know, my, I, I do see that, that people, uh, people who are currently university students are, are among the, a lot of the readership of this book. So I guess time will tell, won't it? <laughs> yes. Oh, I'll just say something very quickly and then shut up. I mean, but the, the alternative to that might be that amazing moment in Time Regained mm -hmm. when, when Marcel is standing on the paving stones, mm -hmm. the uneven paving stones, right? And he's taken back to the moment when he had previously stood on those uneven paving stones and then he hears the sound of the train that he had mm -hmm. once heard before and all of a sudden his past self and his present self seem to exist in perfect continuity mm -hmm. with one another. And I, I feel like there are moments like that in your book too. Oh, and and whether that's, it's not moral instruction, certainly, but it is a way of having, it's a capacity that you have to perceive your own life and, and the way that it is, as Virginia Woolf writes, a, a full life, a whole life. And maybe that is one thing that your novel like Proust's novel teaches oh, us. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but there's lots of ways to live a whole life and you could have like more problems or fewer problems. So like, yeah. I, yeah, for me, it was really exciting to get back, you know, to step on the paving stone and, re, you know, re remember the past and be like, oh my God, it's a work of art. Like now I can, re but like, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily want someone else to have to walk on the same exact paving <laughs> stones, you know, like, it's like, it's like reinventing the wheel. Like let's, let's, let's I don't know, can, can literature be, be progress? Can it, can it teach us and can we like end up at a later point? I don't have an answer to that, yeah. so we're just going to end on okay, that question, right. and you can all go consider it and get back to yeah, get, get back, back to, to us. us. Yeah, get back to us. Thank you so much. Thank Edith. you, this was Marva, wonderful. This was Thank you to all of you. Thank you, wonderful audience. Yay.